Well, good morning. Happy Sunday. It's good to be with you today. Um, hope you all did have a wonderful Thanksgiving. Um, my family and I did. We actually spent our Thanksgiving down in Texas with my wife's side of the family. And as I've told a few people, it exceeded expectations. So sometimes you kind of go into things not sure what's going to happen or, or how people will react to each other. But um, yeah, there, we only had one moment where I thought there was going to be you know, bloodshed when there was, people were talking about politics. So uh, it's not something that's off limits there, <laughs> apparently, at that side of the family. But, uh, but yeah, it turned out quite well. Um, but it is hard to believe that it's December already and cold. Uh, I mean, I look forward to Christmas. These are the kind of things I expect, you know, cold weather and all that. But yeah, as late as, as it seems like Thanksgiving was this year, the, the cold came seem a little too quick. But um, my girls uh, pulled out their, <clears throat> excuse me, their advent calendar this morning, um, which I don't know if, if you and your family ever do things like that. Um, at least one of my girls pulled out their advent calendar. The other one wants to wait. I, I don't think for them it's a matter of counting down to the day till we actually hit Christmas. I think for them it's the guaranteed I'm going to get chocolate for the next 25 days. So, um, which isn't all that bad um, considering how small they were. And what, Rachel, what was it today? Was it a train? Is that what you said? A little chocolate train? So, yeah. It's, Things you know, as we talk about expectations, which is what I want us to focus our attention on a little bit today. <clears throat> I remember when I was a kid, and we would do things like this. The expectation of a chocolate was never really good in those types of containers. So um, I'm hoping they don't have their hopes set too high for that. But um, over the next several Sundays, uh, we're going to take a bit of a break from our um, series in 2 Corinthians and focus our attention on the Advent season. Um, yeah, and we've done this for the last couple of years, but you know, the origin of Advent uh, comes from the Latin word Adventus, which just simply means the coming or the arrival. Um, and This Advent season is a time for us to prepare our hearts and our minds for the celebration of what Christmas really is all about. You know, we talk about, you know, looking and celebrating what the true meaning of Christmas is, but sometimes it takes us being very intentional to prepare for that and to set our our hearts toward that. Um, And so as we just think more about more than just the birth of Jesus, Advent helps us think about what salvation is. Um, And it helps us think about the new life that we have in Christ. Um, And it does also help us think about the return of Christ um, and the hope that we have uh, for eternity. And in most traditions, Advent worship services tend to focus on four main themes. You know, there's hope and peace and joy and love. And often in that order. Um, but we're not like most traditions, right? Um, and like I said, for the last several years, we as a church have tried to, to focus our attention on this Advent season um, and try to incorporate what the broader church does um, in thinking of those themes. Uh, Because we do realize that even though we don't follow a a very strict church calendar the way that some churches do, uh, it is very helpful for us uh, as a part of the global church to be thinking about things and focusing our attention the way that Uh, the global church does. But we thought we would do something a little bit different this year. Um, And so rather than focusing on those four themes, um, starting next Sunday, we're going to do a short series called Above Every Name. And we're going to talk about the names of Jesus that come out of Isaiah 9-6. Wonderful Counselor, 
mighty God, everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. And so we'll take each of those names, those titles of Jesus, and we'll uh, focus on one each week. Um, which if you do the math, that means that we're going to even be talking about it after Christmas too. So, um, but this morning, since it's the first Sunday of the month, uh, and it's the Sunday in which we usually set aside for communion, um, I wanted us to just take a little bit of time focusing on um, really what Christmas means um, in terms of the expectation of it um, and how we can turn our hearts toward really uh, thinking of Jesus as to why he came as well. So um, so let's pray together and then we'll, um, we'll get into it. Father, what a wonderful joy it is for us to come to you this morning with our songs, with our prayer, to be with other believers, other brothers and sisters in Christ, and for us to turn our attention on why we are here, how we got to this place. And we're thankful for who you are and what you've done. Uh, Yet, all too often, uh, our thoughts of those things uh, can be one or two times out of the year. And other times it may just be the one day out of the week. Yet your presence among us is something that is a reality uh, that should um, focus our our attention and our actions um, every single day of the week, every single day of the year. And Father, as we're coming off just a season of thanksgiving, uh, we are thankful for the way that you have blessed us, the way that you've provided for us even in the difficult things, the way that you've brought us through, that you've allowed us to not be crushed by grief or despair, how you've given us hope. And there are so many things that we have to be thankful for. And we want to continue that that even now in this, this new season of Christmas, which is a joy and something that we, um, in many ways, look forward to, even when we know that there will be difficult days and there will be people um, among us who it will be hard and painful as they go into a season uh, of celebrating without loved ones or celebrating uh, in the midst of trials. It is something we look forward to because we know what it means. That God is with us, has come to us. And so God, turn our hearts toward that. Thank you that you, the eternal God, became a weak and frail human being to be like us, to suffer among us so that we could live with you eternally. And so we praise you and we thank you. And this morning, uh, I pray that we would think about things deeply. We would walk away changed and that we would be like your son. Let me pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm, I'm really thankful, and I didn't know this was going to happen, uh, that David and the worship team uh, chose to start our service with Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. Uh, it really is a perfect song for us to kick off the Christmas season. 
Um, and not only is it really a, a great song in and of itself, um, but it fits the Advent season perfectly. That, that idea of that coming, the idea of waiting, uh, is, is there throughout the entire lyrics of the song. And one of the things I like about this hymn and how Charles Wesley wrote it is, is that he used scripture in nearly every line of the song. Uh, he alludes to scripture at least one or more times in just about every phrase. The, the, and this idea, this, this double nature of Advent, of his first coming and, and then his second coming, uh, is reflected in the text of the song. Um, so listen to these lyrics again. Come thou long expected Jesus, born to set thy people free. From our fears and sins release us, let us find our rest in thee. Israel's strength and consolation, hope of all the earth thou art. Dear desire of every nation, joy of every longing heart. You can see uh, ideas of that from the Old Testament. You see phrases from Luke, and you see phrases from the book of Haggai in that. And then in the second stanza, born thy people to deliver, born a child and yet a king, born to reign in us forever, now thy gracious kingdom bring. That, that repetition of born uh, is a reminder of the incarnation. And that It wasn't just that God, that, that he saved us from heaven from afar, but that he came and was born to be among us. By thy own eternal spirit, rule in our hearts alone. By, by thine all-sufficient merit, raise us to thy glorious throne. And just the idea there, and it, by his merit, not by any merit of our own, nothing that we could do, right? not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, according to his merit, uh, that we can be raised to an eternal home. And this song brings, and it rings of this sense of longing, of, of expectation, of joy, and of hope. And these are all the things that the people of God have been expectantly waiting for ever since sin entered into the world. Ever since God promised way back in Genesis chapter 3 that the offspring of a woman would crush Satan's head. All of those, all of us who have trust in God have been waiting for a Savior. And the story of the Old Testament, in many ways, is a story of how God chose the nation of Israel to be the people through whom the Messiah would be born and bring salvation to the world. As the song says, Jesus is not only Israel's strength and consolation, but the hope of all the world. He's the desire of every nation. And whether they know it or not, he's the one that they are looking for. He's the one that every nation is, should be desiring. Jesus is the savior of the entire world. And he is the joy of every longing heart. But sometimes, though, our expectations can get in our way. And sometimes our expectations cause us to miss out on some really good things. Right? Like some people had some pretty high expectations yesterday, right? Uh, I, I know, I said I wasn't going to do that, but, but I'm not that, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. All right, side note, my dad just a couple days ago said, how are you going to, you know, if you're speaking on Sunday, how are you going to show up on Sunday after Michigan gets beat? And I said, well, I, I, I will probably wear scarlet and gray just as a sign of unity, but, but it's not beneath me to, to not do that. So. Uh, or, so anyway, big tangent, I'm sorry, I won't do that again. 
But you think of expectations as we approach Christmas season, like we all have them. We, you know, we, we want, you know, a white Christmas. We want to be home for the holidays. We want to bite into a Whitman sampler chocolate and actually get the caramel piece or, or the piece that at least you're expecting it to be, right? Like I did this over Thanksgiving where I bit into a piece of candy off a box. I looked at the, the, the instructions. I don't know, that's not the right word. What the, whatever. The, I looked at the box and said, this is what you're going to get. And I thought I was going to get the caramel, but instead I got a coconut. And it wasn't good. <laughs> My expectations ruined it. I probably wouldn't have liked it anyway, but, you know, we also have expectations when, especially when we were kids, where we wanted a certain gift, and we opened up a box, and it was a really nice gift, but it wasn't what we had wanted, right? Our expectations get in the way and sometimes ruined, and we miss what was really good there for us. Now, all God-fearing Jews were expecting the Messiah. They were expecting a Savior. But when he came, most people, including the well-educated religious leaders, especially the well-educated religious leaders, they missed it. Yeah, they were looking for the promised Messiah, but their expectations caused them to miss him when he arrived. And There were five typical things that was what they were looking for uh, in their Messiah. The first thing is that that the Messiah was going to be a descendant of David. And yeah, Jesus fit that. They shouldn't have missed that. But they also thought that, that he would gain sovereignty over the land of Israel. And, you know, at the time, Israel being occupied by Romans, that was something that was like, yeah. If the Messiah is going to come and he's going to get rid of these occupiers and he's going to free us from that. He's going to give us sovereignty over our land. The third thing that the Messiah was going to do is he was going to gather the Jews from the four corners of the earth. You Think about that. In the Roman Empire and there was a decree that went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed and everyone is going to go to their hometown to be taken in a census. And so at that time, they were bringing everybody back from all, four, all the corners of the earth into their homeland. And so Jesus fit that, but they missed it. The fourth thing that they were expecting is that the Messiah was going to restore them to the full observance of, of the law. Um, and in some ways you can think, well, maybe that, that explains a little bit of the legalism that the Pharisees had, is that if they really wanted to be ready and prepared and they wanted to be doing everything that the law said, because that's what the Messiah would be moving people toward, is for everybody to be living according to the law. And then the last thing that they were looking for in the Messiah was that he would bring, bring peace to the whole world. And yes, Jesus did that, but not in the way that they expected. Jesus brought the kind of peace that made us right and at peace with God. And then ultimately, he will bring peace to the entire world. But that's not the way that they were thinking. And so because of their understanding and their expectations of what the Messiah would do and what he would look like and how he would um, take over, so to speak... They missed it. And so when Jesus came, he didn't have the riz of a political or military leader. All right, sorry, I won't do that again either. Riz, I had to ask what that meant. That, that's charisma, right? Okay, that's, I'm too old to be using terms like that. So um, won't do that again. But Jesus didn't have that, that charisma of the political or military leaders, but Jesus, who being very God, whose glory never ends, set aside his glory and came to earth to bear our sin and our sadness. 
He was born a child and yet a king. And that's amazing on several fronts. First, born a child. Again, God, infinite, all-powerful, everlasting, creator of everything, became like one of his creations. It was born as a human baby. Our church is full and growing with a number of babies. To think that our God was like one of these small, innocent, helpless babies. That blows my mind. And yet on top of that, even though he was a king, and king of all creation, and of course on a human level, a descendant of King David, so he was the rightful heir to David's throne, Jesus wasn't born as a king. He didn't come in, into a palace. He wasn't born into luxury. He didn't come as an influencer. He was born in humility. To poor parents in a barn. And then not even placed in a cradle or in a bed, but in an animal's feeding trough. Now, he didn't come bragging about his credentials. He came lowly and humble. You know, there was one man in all of Israel that recognized Jesus for who he was. And it's found at the end of Luke chapter 2. I'll I'll read this, and you don't have to turn there, but in Luke chapter 2, verse 25... So there was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. And when the parents brought in the child, Jesus, to do for him what was custom of the law. Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all the people, a light for the revelation of the Gentiles and for the glory of your people Israel. There was this man, this older man, a man of faith, who by God's grace allowed him to see this baby as the long-expected Savior. Can you imagine living with that kind of waiting, that kind of eager anticipation, knowing that God has promised you that you would not die until you got to see the one for whom you're waiting? I would imagine that every day he would wake up and say, is today the day? Is today the day I get to see my Savior? I think about how we, as believers on this side of the cross, get to say, is today the day? Now, hopefully it's not, you know, because we die and get to see him, but is today the day that Jesus is coming back? Or if I were to die today, this will be the day that I get to see my Savior. Especially living in a broken world like we live in today, that type of anticipation of come Lord Jesus is something uh, that should, uh, should not weigh on us, but be, should be something that we are anticipating and looking forward to. I'm just saying things, the scripture doesn't say here how he was able to recognize that Jesus was the strength and consolation of Israel. But he did. He did see it. 
And he praised the Lord when he saw him. And he said, now your servant can depart in peace. You know, we, we sang earlier, uh, another one of the songs we sang come out, comes out of Isaiah chapter 25. Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him and he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. And it's in this that allows us or helps us even as we approach communion. This birth of a baby obviously was not just any baby. But it's what leads to why we even celebrate communion. Paul David Tripp said, Jesus came into the world because what he came to do was desperately needed and could not be done any other way. We have this disease of sin that is inescapable. And our sin has left us separated from God and it places us under his judgment. But God wasn't willing for us to remain in this hopeless and lost condition. And so he sent a savior. He sent his only son so that we could be forever with him, that our sins could be paid for and taken care of and forgiven. So he lived a life that we could never live, so to die a death that we should have died, to rise from the grave, to defeat sin and death, and then ascend back to heaven to be with the Father, to rule over all things for our sake. And that is the point of the Christmas story. Jesus was born so that sinners like me and like you could be reconciled to God. And that's why we celebrate communion. In communion, we remember his death that made it all possible. His death was made possible, of course, by his birth and his sinless life. God became a man. John 1.14 says, So the word became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. Or as Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 2, Though he was God, he did not think equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took on the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. And when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. So Christmas and Easter, they are necessary parts of each other. You can't have one without the other. So his death was made possible because of his birth and his life. But his death was meaningful because of his resurrection. Had Jesus not risen from the dead, he would have been just like any one of us. We live our life. We make claims and we die. Yet by rising from the gra grave, he proved that he was who he said he was and could do what he said he could do. And in doing so, he defeated sin and he defeated death so that we could have eternal life with him. 
His resurrection is the proof of the hope that we have for eternity. So in a moment here, we're, we're going to celebrate communion together. And we're going to take time just to focus on why Jesus came and how his life and how his death has meaning for all of us. So, for those of you who have been around us before, uh, EBC before, or who maybe you haven't been around, we here at EBC celebrate an open communion, which really all that means is that you don't have to be a part of our church to take it with us. Um, You don't have to be a Baptist. But if you have given your life to Christ, if you trust in him to pay for the penalty of your sin, we invite you to take these elements with us, uh, to celebrate with us. But if you've never given your life to Christ, if you don't know this Savior that we talk about, um, I would encourage you that today is the day to turn to him. And if you don't know what that means, if you don't know how to do that, I encourage you to talk to the person next to you. I'm sure every person in this room would be happy to tell you what it means, how you can have a personal relationship with Jesus. And often when we take communion together, uh, we also use it as a time of just personal reflection. There are times when we, uh, we look at the words of Paul when he says that whoever eats the bread or drinks of this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. We don't often talk about uh, the fullness of what that means. But in many ways, the way that we want to uh, apply that uh, uh, amongst a broader body of believers is we don't take this lightly. It's not just something that we do uh, as a religious activity or something that we do uh, because we ought. But we do that uh, as an act of worship. And we also want to do that with pure and clean hearts as we come before the Lord. Which might mean that if there is something between you and another member of the church, not just between you and God, but between you and another member of the church, that this would be a great time to make that right. Now, before we go back and we uh, take the element to first go to somebody and say, you know, there's something between us. There's something that's not right that we need to get straight between you and God. And so I want to encourage you to do that. So like I said, in a moment, we're going to go back. We have um, tables on either side and in the back. Um, So we'll go back together and get those and bring them back to your seat. Um, And we'll take those together. But while you're doing that, do that in, in, a, in a way of reflection. Do that in a way of, of ensuring that things are right between you and God and things are right between you and other people within the church. Because what he did for us is worthy of us to come before him with, uh, with a pure and a clean heart and coming with right motives. So...